Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sasha Powell, and I'm the CEO of the Froebel Trust, which is your host for today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us, and I'd like to thank Victoria Arneal, my colleague, for organising today's event. Um, the Froebel Trust is the only grant-making trust in the UK that devotes its funding exclusively for original research and practice development for work with young children from birth to eight and their families. All our activities um, are designed to promote education and learning that upholds and advances the principles derived from Friedrich Froebel's philosophy and practice. Um, each year we dedicate around half a million pounds for original research and this seminar is one in a series that's meant to help make research more widely available and accessible. In 2018, Professor Maggie McClure and Dr. Karina McRae from the Education and Social Research Centre at Manchester Metropolitan University were awarded one of uh, the Froebel Trust's open call research grants uh, for their project, which is called Listening To, number two, investigating sensory motor learning in two-year-olds uh, in partnership with Martinscroft Nursery School. Uh, they'll present their work today uh, to us in three sections. So there'll be opportunities for Q&A in between and at the very end of the presentation. Uh, so if you have a question or indeed a comment, um, as some of you have already been doing, um, you, can, you can add your question and comment. Um, if possible, please, um, I think it should be visible. Uh, there is a Q and A symbol at the bottom. Um, and if you could possibly use Q and A rather than chat, that would be really helpful. And I will monitor um, what's going into the Q and A box. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, throughout this presentation, your video and your mic as a participant have been muted. So um, we can't see you or hear you, um, but uh, we want you to be aware that we are recording this event um, so that we can share it online in the next couple of weeks and we'll let you know when that happens. Um, I'm really delighted that Maggie and Christina have agreed to share their learning with us today. And I'm now going to hand over to them uh, to begin the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for that. I'll be very brief. Um, I'm Maggie McClure, and as Sasha said, I'm Professor of Education at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I work with Christina on the Listening To project. And we've been very excited to do this research. Uh, and this is the first time that we've worked with the Trust. And we would like to express our appreciation for the very productive and supportive relationship that the Trust has with its uh, projects. Um, it's just been an absolute joy to work with uh, Sasha and Victoria and the others. So um, that's what I'm going to say for now, because Christina is going to introduce herself and then she's going to launch straight into saying a little bit more about the project. Christina? Hi, um, I'm Christina and I'm also at Manchester Met University. Um, and with Maggie, um, I, I'm located in the research group called Children and Childhoods. Um, and my background is actually as a, a nursery school teacher of three and four year old. Um, but my current research for the last four years has been focused on two year olds. Um, and and um, as Sasha said, uh, we're going to talk in three sections just so that we've got an opportunity to pause and people can ask questions. Um, so um, the first section, um, I'll just introduce the background to the project. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, methodology and then Maggie will talk a little bit about data and analysis of the data. Uh, so I'm still trying to work out how to move on. Here we go. So yes, um, background to, to listening to. So as you know, the project's been funded by the Froebel Trust um, and it focuses on two-year-olds. And our key question is to explore how much Frobelian principles can help us to reconceptualize the sensory motor relationships 
that very young children have with their environment. Oh, let me go back. Skipping ahead. There we go. <laughs> um, so the project's located in Martinscroft Nursery School and Children's Centre in Manchester. And some of the two-year-olds that attend are funded directly by parents and others have funded two-year-old places. And this state-funded provision responds to a national preoccupation with improving um, uh, uh, the educational, narrowing the educational gap between richer and poorer families and improving parenting skills. The curriculum and the policy discourse around two-year-old funded places is characterised by terms such as uh, gaps, deficits and risks and these in turn are linked to universalised and standardised um, uh, and primarily cognitive constructions of children and their development. So um, I'll just try and give you an example of this. Last week I was listening to a vlog that was being hosted by an early years platform where um, they were introducing the spokesper a spokesperson for the Department for Education um, to outline guidelines for young children in response to COVID-19. Um, and they were discussing these in relation to the return of children to nursery this week. So it was for practitioners trying to work out how to um, organize the nurseries. And the host said, the sooner they get to school, back to school, the sooner they'll start developing again. So I was struck by this statement because of how it seemed to assume that the children hadn't been developing at all, all the time that they'd been at home. This focus on deficits and gaps in children's knowledge, we should remember conflicts with some of the Frobelian principles that lie at the heart of much early years provision in the UK. So whilst many of Froebel's principles of self-directed play have been enshrined in early years practice, at the same time, the standardizing of the early years curriculum into measurable outcomes has meant that the inaction of policy casts a shadow over the worldscape of the nursery. And of course, coronavirus is also casting its shadow over the landscape of early years provision right now. And with a, a real intensity this week, because this is the week when early year settings are having to navigate how to open up their provision safely. And of course, when we planned this seminar, we could never ever have imagined that this is the scenario that we find ourselves in. And when uh, lockdown started, we were at the kind of halfway stage of our data collection part of the phase of the project. So we're still very much feeling our way forward in terms of how the project will respond to the crisis. And we're remotely in touch with staff and families, uh, some of whom are sharing video clips with us while they're in lockdown. And with others, we're looking forward to watching film data gathered by parents at home during the lockdown period. Um, and the webinar itself has had to respond to these changed circumstances because our original plan had been to be in a room in Manchester um, with parents and staff who could have been more directly involved during what would have been an interactive workshop session um, where we would have watched slow motion clips together. But um, staff and parents at the moment are in the middle of juggling this very tricky week um, and it, actually getting the nursery ready today and, and this week to take children in gradually over the coming weeks. We're very lucky that um, Shabna Amin, who's the room leader for the funded two-year-old class, has been able to join us today as well as uh, Lisa Taylor, who's the head teacher at the school, and we hope we've got a few parents in the audience um, who will be listening when, when they can, childcare permitting, and who hopefully will be able to ask, answer any questions. Again, childcare permitting if you have questions. Um, so. There we go. 
Okay. So why Froebel? One reason that we're interested in reviving an interest in Froebel is geographical. Um, and it's about being located in Manchester. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, Manchester had many uh, strong links with Froebel. Um, in the late 19th century, there were a few uh, Manchester-based industrialists who were inspired by Froebel schools and set up their own. And one famous example is Robert Owen's school, although that school, the school that he eventually set up was actually in Lanarkshire, but he was a, a Manchester industrialist. And then later, uh, the teaching college of the University of Manchester, where Grace Owen taught, uh, became an institution that had a reputation for teaching, training uh, nursery school teachers. And the college had close links with Fabian pedagogy, and Susan Isaacs, who started the Maltings Nursery, is a famous graduate from, from that college. And this photograph is actually one of the first, if not the first, Froebel Nursery School in the country. And it's in Moss Side, Manchester, uh, just five minutes away, walk away from Martins Croft Nursery School. Um, sadly, long since knocked down, I think you can see, if you look carefully, there's cobblestones there. But our key motivation um, has been to work with Froebel's concepts of self-activity and unfoldment and we're exploring what these two concepts might have to offer in relation to children's sensory motor learning. With his background in natural history and his particular interest in forestry and also the growth of crystals, Froebel included human growth in his wider thinking uh, about the growth of animals, plants, and even minerals. And for us, it's these uh, principles of unfoldment and self-activity that are significant in terms of how he sees these processes as characterizing the growth of all things. Like Piaget, Froebel's interested in process, but unlike Piaget, he doesn't separate growth into such clear stages. He resists what he calls sharp limits and definite subdivisions when he thinks about development, because he says this distracts our attention from what he calls the permanent continuity and the inner living essence. He calls this an outleading process um, and a, it's a general life principle rather than something that's exclusively human. And it's a life force that leads the child to reach out towards the world, but also he talks about it as a following process. So one of his words that he uses a lot is absorption, and uh, he talks about how we absorb the material world. Uh, he also talks about the way that when hands play with materials, they show, in his words, the plastic expression of ideas. So thinking here is always in relation to doing or acting. And one of the other threads of Froebel's thinking that we wanted to pick up on was his interest in parents as the persons who know their children most intimately. Intimacy for him was an important fund of knowledge that parents hold, a way of knowing that at its best is always unfolding as parents uh, learn with and from children because of the very simple fact that they live together and share a space together. So this belief in the shared life of parents and children recognises the importance of the everyday, whether this is our daily routines, habits or ongoing uh, encounters that children have with the small, small things in life. It's a ph philosophy that recognizes that in the ordinary of the everyday, extraordinary things happen, um, just so long as we can notice them. And it's a pedagogy that sees the richness of the domestic and the home lives of children, which of course is particularly interesting at the moment in, in the time of coronavirus. So uh, the reason we wanted to uh, do the research at Martinscroft is because of our pre-existing relationship with the nursery setting. Um, 
with the project starting with this idea of throwballs that parents know their children intimately, but also that this mutual relationship can be strengthened by valuing this knowledge. And the idea of working alongside parents actually grew out of a previous project um, called the Sensory Nursery, which was funded by strategic internal university funding in 2016. And this earlier research was an ethnographic project that followed two cohorts of two-year-olds at Martinscroft, uh, which also is just around the corner of the Faculty of Education. And in that project, I took up the position of a researcher in residence, and I visited the classroom regularly during term time. I was a participant observer and I filmed play events on an iPad and it was in this project that I discovered the potential of using slow motion film as a research methodology. But crucially over this project and working with the practitioners, um, we found that there was a, a kind of sense of community that began to form between us through the shared noticings by focusing on, on the film clips. So things that surprised us, things that interested us, and often these, um, these moments were ones that uh, Joe Tobin, the early childhood uh, researcher calls, the kind of moments that are missing from research, not necessarily because they stand out, but because they're too quiet for us to hear, too small for us to see, and so apparently uneventful that they fall beneath the threshold of our attention. So it was this sense of uh, community that we really wanted to not only grow, but also to more explicitly include parents in. Um, and that was the starting place for this current uh, project, which we called Listening To because we wanted to expand on the idea of listening as something that's more than simply hearing words and sounds. We wanted to think about listening as something that's caught up in all our senses and that it's a way of paying attention and reading other bodies. And the research also um, has partly come into being because of the generosity of the school and its head teacher, Lisa Taylor, who we've worked very closely with, and the staff, and in particular Shabnam Amin, who is the room lead for the two-year-old room. With great hospitality, Shabnam and her team um, of, of uh, practitioners have made a space for me in the classroom. And increasingly, this has led to Shabnam and staff members documenting their own case studies um, alongside mine, where they too are giving visibility to children's activities. So this current project builds on these established relationships, but it's um, enlarged the research space by inviting parents to contribute film clips as part of the project archive. So here research learns from and with the parents as much as learning with and from children and nursery staff. Um, listening to offers a space where parents and key workers in the nursery who want to have a space to share their noticings as a shared research enterprise. Um, and actually Maggie and I have just finished writing a paper um, where um, we, we were very much informed and uh, in discussion with um, one of the parents who I'm, I think is here today, I can't see all the names, um, and really appreciated that sense of conversation which we were um, able to do in spite of lockdown. And I'll pause here so, so that maybe there are questions um, or comments that Sasha can pick up, pick up on. Thank you, Chris. Christina. Um, we haven't had any questions pop up yet. We may do so uh, now that you've just stopped talking. But um, I was fascinated by some of the things that you've said in, in this first part of your presentation. I was thinking about when you, you talked about uh, intimacy as an important fund of knowledge and parents and children's shared lives being um, uh, not only important, but 
um, as you referred to Joe Tobin, sometimes the things that are deemed uneventful, just as the, the small things, the, the extraordinary in the ordinary, as you described it, may go unnoticed. And I was thinking about this time of COVID-19 and what a difference perhaps that has made to that shared life of children and families, um, but also those shared lives uh, within the settings where uh, key workers' children have continued to attend and clearly practitioners and teachers have continued to be working. And, as, and during these times, and perhaps as we go forwards potentially with smaller uh, pods uh, of children attending settings, I wonder whether there might be opportunities for more of that noticing, those shared noticings that you, you have talked about, or whether you think that might become all the more difficult uh, as a consequence. A very good point. Um, I, I, I think it, it, there's, a, there's a possibility to go both ways and it feels like it is really important at this moment to really see what the potentials are and to really try to fight for keeping that space, that enlarged space so that we can take time and we can notice. And like you said, the, with these smaller pods, that should enable that. But I think that's why it's been such a difficult time um, during this this current week and the weeks leading up to it for practitioners and head teachers trying to think about how they can make that opening supportive of children um, and not to allow all the rules and the anxiety to get in the way so it's a really it is a really interesting time maybe at the end there are people in classrooms if you'd like to say something about that because I think Absolutely. it's a really big tension Yes, thanks, Christina. Um, we've we've had a couple of points. One one is a point rather than a, a question from uh, Peppy, who who says that um, she's interested that we're referring to parents, and um, she thinks that um, the the term carers is equally as relevant. Um, and, and and I don't know if you want to to qualify what you mean by parents uh, as the term that you're using. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. It's a, a mission not to say include carers in that um, very strongly. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we've also had a question, or, or again, I suppose, a point from, from Valeria, um, who talks about um, listening again as, as a sort of coverall term meaning uh, multi-sensory, um, not specifically listening with our ears, but listening with our whole bodies and in different ways. Is, is that the kind of listening to which you're referring? And perhaps you'll talk a bit more about that in the next part of your, your presentation. Do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, it, it's very interesting because there is a kind of convergence, I think, um, uh, in the way people are thinking about the uh, intermingling of the senses at the moment it gets described sometimes as the haptic um, which kind of foregrounds touch but the, it is that idea that although we as we become increasingly adult our senses are specialized into different areas that you can actually think of um, listening as being a kind of um, sensing that's not that different from seeing in some ways so i guess the underpinning kind of rationale for the project is to try and think about how you can acknowledge the um the sensorium the child's you know the way that they and our, all of us the way our senses work together to uh, make the world for us so that yeah it's a great question Valeria. and we haven't had any other comments as yet so i don't know um, whether anyone wants to quickly type something before we move on um, otherwise perhaps you want to move on to your mm -hmm. I'm not i'm not seeing anything coming in so um yeah let's let's move on if you're happy to do that yeah. thank you for your questions and comments so far keep them coming in <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'll talk a little bit about um the research methodologies that we've been using um, documentation as practice visual ethnography and slow motion video um, and um, yeah I, I before i talk about the slow motion and the visual ethnography i want to focus a little bit on the case studies and the documentation that staff have been 
producing alongside the collection of film clips and the analysis that um, Maggie and myself have been doing. Um, see if I can move it on. Louisa Penfold talks about uh, how pedagogical documentation acts as a reflective process that encourages dialogue and debate surrounding children's learning practices, developing what Karen Morris calls a community of philosophical inquirers. And um, I think that's exactly what these case studies do. They make us ask philosophical questions. So uh, this um, image here comes from a much longer piece of documentation that Shabnam put together to document a play spell where a child responded to materials that had been offered uh, uh, to play with that day. And um, I think it really demonstrates how documenting an event be can become a way of caring for that event. And this can inform uh, our practice. In this case, you know what, my doorbell's just rung. <laughs> Posty. I think it's okay. Someone's going to answer it, yes. Uh, so in this case, it focused attention on the um, active part played by string and holes. And I'm put off by the postman. There we go. And it also um, can help us think about ways that the event unfolded in unexpected uh, directions. So when we pay attention to the self activities of children, this helps us to notice rather than observe. And we kind of, I think that observing often leads us to make judgments about children's progress, which is part of the, uh, the, the pressures of standardization that we talked about earlier. Whereas noticing helps us to, um, change the way that we approach children in a more intuitive way, which again is something that Froebel was interested in. So after documenting uh, a play event, uh, Shabnam reflected that predetermining things closes things down. Children know more than they can verbally tell us. And then that led on to the thought that not only uh, do children grow, but also ideas grow. And Shabnam said, ideas take time, they need to grow. And then we started to think about that a little more. We thought about how ideas as things, um, the idea that, yeah, ideas as things that grow in the same way that plants do or uh, crystals, so again, going back to that Frobelian idea, it felt like actually it was asking these quite big questions about how we need that time for things to unfold in, in that gradual way. And I will now just talk a little bit, focus on the slow motion um, as method. Um, so, Video and particularly slow motion video has been really important to us. When we initially planned this seminar, we'd hope we would be able to show slow motion clips from homes and classrooms and invite you participants to engage with film clips alongside staff and parents. But we don't feel comfortable about sharing film clips of identifiable children virtually. So um, I'll talk more about slowing down film as a methodology of paying attention and, um, and how it's happened in the classroom. Since January, I've been spending two days a week in the setting and I've been using video to occasionally record everyday events in the classroom. At the outset, parents were invited to become co-researchers and contribute film clips of everyday events of their children in their homes. So before Christmas, I was in the classroom, but getting to know parents and going through the consent process, which took a long time. Um, really, um, lots of uh, 
discussion about how it would work. Uh, we have um, some Project Go Pros which parents can borrow. Um, and what I do is I spend half a day in the classroom alongside children and staff and then the other half of the day I spend downloading film footage in the corridor beyond the classroom and that's kind of the space where I can talk to parents. So as parents come out of the room, they've dropped off children. Um, that's a, a place where I can lend GoPros out, um, but also we can watch films that um, parents have chosen to share or to contribute to the project or just talk. Um, and having two uh, university researchers on the project has um, meant that one of us, uh, Maggie, who isn't involved in that daily life of the nursery can watch the films with them um, probably a slightly more curious eye compared to myself, parents and nursery practitioners who are so much more habituated to their everyday, the, these everyday contexts of home, school, um, where we, yeah. So, uh, and the interest of uh, that Maggie and I have in film is very much about its potential to direct our attention to bodies in motion because we're interested in the sensory motor um, and uh, Liz de Freitas who's written a paper called The Moving Image in Education Research talks about the history of film as a scientific tool in education research and she shows how film doesn't just reflect what's happening, but it also actively shapes what and how we see. So right from the earliest days, film has generally frozen movement in order to analyze it. And actually much of the way that we understand child development is founded on work done by Arnold Gessel uh, in the 50s, who mapped stages of development from stills that were taken from action films of children. Liz de Freitas proposes that instead, we should explore the challenges of engaging with the body in its state of movement. And this is a challenge that we've responded to by focusing our attention on what Gilles Deleuze calls the capacities of a non-thinking body. So this is spe specifically a body in movement that we're interested in. And while this body isn't thinking with intention, nevertheless, we regard it as a knowing body. And uh, the key question that we ask is what is a body capable of and how might film help us to learn from it? Film has a unique capacity to allow us to get a sense of the dynamic and changing relationships created by the actions of responding bodies. Because you can play film by slowing it down, it can defamiliarize everyday moments. So slow motion viewing can become a method of watching film but we also um, experiment with other ways of defamiliarizing ourselves through films. So maybe uh, watching film without the sound or even speeding it up. And sometimes it's precisely the film clip that doesn't seem especially important or those that puzzle, puzzle us that become the most interesting. So sometimes a, a parent might share a film with me and they might say, that they don't really know why they filmed it and there's nothing much happening. And sometimes I'll feel the same when I look at it, but then as we re-watch the films, um, especially that using those techniques, then we become more aware of how many things that children do are not ones that we as adults can easily make sense of. We start to notice that they're making sense in different ways to the ways that we, we make sense. Um, and we've been trying to attend very closely to how an action or movement unfolds. And this has led us to thinking uh, more about the term watching as opposed to observing. Um, and we're trying to develop what we're 
uh, talk, calling a methodology of uh, attentive watching and Maggie will talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So having spent time engaged in this practice of watching, we've uh, noticed some recurring motifs and we're using this word motif um, quite deliberately here instead of theme, which is a word that I would have used in the past actually. Um, the reason that we're using motif is because the root of the word um, is associated with movement, mot motif, so there's this link to movement. Whereas theme we think is much more linked to categorizing and uh, coding. So um, lots, of, lots of motifs have emerged and I think more will. Um, and I'll list a few of them. So, oops, let's go back. Children getting inside things, buckets, boxes, under furniture, putting things over their heads. And I always, when I, when I look at that list of things, I often think if I open um, a photo album of my children, I'll probably have quite a few um, images of children doing these things. So it kind of shows how ubiquitous those, those things are. Um, and then children performing actions as if they were someone or something else. So um, in the data, we've got uh, clips of children playing, of children loading a dishwasher or um, hoovering. But when they do these um, actions, it's with this kind of um, studied performance of someone that does this task regularly, even though they, they don't do that. Um, and often, I think you think about these things as being children imitating, but we've been thinking, actually, this is more about children being something very different. They're, they're really trying to become something different. Um, there was even um, a case of a child being um, a melted ice cream, and I don't have that on film, but it's in my head. It's, a, it, it's, it's something that I, I will always, um, I won't be able to forget because it was so expressive of, of, of being melted ice cream. Um, uh, and then children responding to or creating the conditions for things to fall through the air. So bubbles, sand, snowflake. And I think, again, it's interesting. I've noticed there's been a lot of uh, things on social media about bubbles um, in relation to uh, COVID-19. So when schools were opening on the continent, they were putting bubble machines outside the school to help children get make that transition coming in. Um, and then finally, um, children jumping. Um, and in allowing these motifs to emerge, we've intentionally, intentionally tried to focus on what Erin Manning calls minor gestures, uh, which are actions that tend to be overlooked or undervalued in these culturally endorsed hierarchies of significance. Um, and in this next section, what we'll do is we'll just talk about one of those motifs in more detail. We'll talk about um, uh, jumping. Um, and I'll stop now in case we have any questions. I keep on forgetting that I'm talking to all these people because I can't see you. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Um, we do have, we've got a couple of comments and we do have um, a super question, um, which is from Ruth. Um, she said that um, she loves your uh, sense of ideas of things. And her question is about whether besides time, uh, you think that there are other conditions that might encourage the growth of ideas. And I, I love the analogy that she draws on, which is in, in the same way that crystals, very frobelian, have certain conditions that encourage growth. So what, what else besides time? Uh, I'm there. Thank you, Luke, for uh, um, a not surprisingly uh, provocative and creative question. Um, one of the, the things I always think about when I think about Froebel's interest in crystals is that um, uh, Deleuze is also very interested in crystals as an alternative to what we think of as, you know, ordinary growth and development. And he says that uh, events like crystals, this is a quote somewhere, grow outwards from the edges. And um, 
I'm not sure quite what that means in terms of the conditions for um, ideas growing like crystals, but it is something like um, committing to the idea that ideas will um, themselves develop and unfold as events unfold. And one of the things that we've noticed, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in the next section, is um, how what complex processes of attunement and taking things forward to a next step are embedded in the mundane events that children are involved in. So in that sense, I think the ideas and the um, senses and feelings are all kind of um, uh, growing outwards from the edges. So one of the things you could think about, about our methodology is that we're looking for the unfolding of events rather than just the development of meaning or the acquisition of learning or whatever. Um, but that's about as much sense I can make at the moment of that really great question. So I'm going to hand it back to Christina now. <laughs> Just to add to that, um, and on the subject of Deleuze, he talks about um, when you encounter something, it forces you to think. So uh, thinking about the material and the encounters. So again, which links, I think, to Froebel. So thinking about the, the, the gifts and the material aspects of the nursery, which... Um, so yeah, I think that relationship between as you encounter materials, in turn, you respond by, by, by doing, and that is a, a thinking response. I guess the other thing, not to take up this on for too long, but the other thing about the conditions for crystals growing is that they require a seed, a sort of um, something, not necessarily an organic seed, but some um, frisson of almost nothingness around which everything else develops. And I think that kind of, captures the unfoldingness as well. Um, I wonder if Ruth has anything that she'd like to add herself. Let's give her a moment. Um, yes. <laughs> to, to, um, and while perhaps she's had a chance to do that, so I'm sorry if it means we're dipping back and forth a little bit. Um, I, I have a couple of, well, in fact, three more questions, but um, I'm going to bring in one from Rosie Fluitt, uh, which is about whether you felt that the films that the parents made offered new motifs to your thinking. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, it offered a, a different context. So f for me, it was that sense of the domestic, which of course, when you're in school, you're so entwined in those, in those, in the classroom, um, so it kind of offered that sense of the everyday of home uh, and children in those responses. Um, I don't think, I think the motifs um, uh, were very, happen in, 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 both, in both places, in both spaces. Um, uh, and I guess maybe there are some things that at home, because maybe you don't think of home as being the place of learning where they just unfold and you don't really, it's fine. But maybe when they happen at school, then that can be seen as maybe less productive or constructive or leading to something because the school environment is so geared towards a particular type of learning. Um, I think that sounds uh, 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 both challenging and fascinating and um, I want to bring in a question that Stella Louis has asked because um, it perhaps pertains differently to different contexts although in a Frobelian sense maybe it shouldn't. Her question is um, do our unfoldment and self-activity also link to the inner life of the child and outer expressions? Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's an amazing question. So, and that, well, for me, that's something that I'm kind of really interested in trying to think a little bit more about. So, um, uh, what, what I'm really interested in with Froebel is that he doesn't have that, he does have this sense of a pole between inner and outer. He doesn't see them as separate. He's all, he, he's against binaries in that sense. 
Um, and so even thinking about that sense of the child when they become something else, it feels that that process is about this pole of self and other and inner and outer. So, and that whole concept of unfolding again is something quite unique because he, he is so, um, uh, doesn't want to kind of get into that opposition and he talks about these poles. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I think I need to do more work on. So I've just, there is a new book out on Froebel that talks a lot more about how central his ideas of the, the, the he calls it the law of the spheres, which is that mm. relationship between inner and outer and how uh, that, um, that side of his thinking is a side that often has been not really, um, partly to do with translation, but maybe partly to do with the, the uh, things that get taken up to do with the zeitgeist of um, early years practice. So um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting area. It is. That's, is it Helga Wasmuth's book? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Just in case anybody was wondering, yes, yes um, we could uh, send out the details of that in case anyone's interested later on. Um, uh, uh, do we have time for a, a couple more points at this stage or did you, we do have more if, if there is time? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, one, one of the first things um, that, that we uh, received in relation to this section um, was a comment from Sue about um, practitioners, teachers needing to uh, listen with all their senses on returning to, to practice for those who haven't yeah. been continued in practice during the lockdown. And in, in relation to this making sense and perhaps what you were just describing around um, um, the, the inner outer, um, I, uh, you used the expression, how we are making sense of the data. And when you talk about making sense, what do you mean as a data analyst and interpreter? Um, methodologically, what does that mean? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> It's a word that we bandy around making sense and I think, I mean, Christina might have a slightly different uh, take on this, but I think <clears throat> it's not really about making sense of the data as if we were forming the data. It's actually allowing the data to generate sense in us, I would think of. So that, I, and I think that kind of goes to the thinking we're doing around um, attunement and um, being alert to change and difference. So it's not so much that we take the data as if it was dead matter and we mold it into meaning. Mm. It's more about trying to um, uh, tune into moments of um, importance or difference while being part of that, those events ourselves. So in that sense, our notion of making sense is a much more, you know, what people would call imminent. We don't stand mm. outside the data and bestow meaning on it, um, which is a kind of classic research. Yes. Phrase. It is much more about um, uh, almost kind of developing ways of attending to the data that allow it to speak to us, if you like, whatever the data are. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've just had a, a comment that that relates to what you've just been been talking about. I think so. Um, I'm I'm just going to to pass on a, a comment from Shabnam, um, who goes back to the point uh, the discussion around crystals, mm -hmm. and um, she says that um, the Frobelian principle of uniqueness of children, uh, mm -hmm. crystals form differently, having space to grow and forming patterns. Um, so she's making a, a link there uh, between children's uniqueness and, and crystal's uniqueness, which I think is lovely. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice. <laughs> and we, we did have one other a very practical question from Valeria, which is about using food um, as a play item. Uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, You showed the film of children using <laughs> pasta. Oh, yes. That is just so thought provoking, um, the whole issue about food becoming a play thing and um, how, you know, in certain contexts that could become quite a provocative and uh, 
um, culturally problematic thing um, to do. So, I mean, I, you know, I thank you to Valeria for raising it. It's, um, it shows again that objects have different meanings um, when they enter into different contexts. And part of those meanings are always cultural and they're always political. So, yeah, great observation. Yeah, to add to that, actually, uh, um, when, uh, when, when lockdown was starting and the school was uh, responding to, um, to lockdown, to, um, to, uh, to communicate with parents different kinds of activities that they could be doing, it was lockdown that actually made the thing about using food kind of come up as an issue. Suddenly lockdown made people think, oh yes, there's this issue about food because of course there were shortages of pasta. So suddenly that whole situation changes how you see pasta. So it is really interesting, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, I, I, we've got one more question, if you feel that we have time to take that question at this moment. Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, so it's, it's, I don't know who it's from, sorry, but it's um, about getting consent. Again, a very pragmatic, but really important ethical question about getting consent uh, from parents. What, you know, what was that process like? Um, and, and what kind of time was involved it, it in it or invested in that process was it a slow process for example very good question and it it um it involves different bits so there's a, for for us we realized when we started this project that we actually hadn't given enough time for the institutional part of the uh, uh process because um that has become increasingly um long and complicated in terms of uh, having to um, abide by GDPR, make sure that lots of things are included in the consent forms, which are at the same time supposed to be um, accessible and in plain English. And um, so there's this tension that we were always grappling with. How do we talk about the project in an accessible way when we also have to use this legal speak? Um, and then there's a long, it takes a long time to actually get these approved and the longer, the more complex they become, the longer that, that particular process is. But then alongside that process was the, the actual, um, the being with the parents and talking to parents. So it, it, there, it feels like there's also a whole element of that, which is about relationships. And actually, um, one of the things that has guided our um, ethics has been that you're constantly renegotiating it. So you're going back to parents saying, is it okay to do this or is it not okay to do that? So you're actually doing a lot more than perhaps you're, institutionally were requested to do because it's it is about a relationship really with parents um, and um, again you know one's co communicating with parents who may have not so much language uh, English language rather uh, so again you know ways of, of finding people who will translate uh, feeling your way just as a school does um, and I guess one of the things um, about that again is about time. So the, the space of time before Christmas where I was in the nursery before I was gathering data was about becoming a person who parents knew who we had a relationship with um, before we started the data gathering. So there was a long time given to that because for me it seems to me that so much of that is about having that kind of relationship before you start the data gathering. Have you got more to add, Maggie? No, I think that's, that's fine, except to say that, yes, it was a lengthy pro uh, process in terms of simply the logistics of taking ethics seriously and seeing it as iterative. Um, that can actually, it's not something that you do and then you quickly leap into the project. It is a, um, it's a long process technically, but also it's a long process ethically um, 
in keeping that at the forefront. Thank you both. I think, uh, uh, you know, so we've, uh, well, and everyone, we've had some really thought provoking questions and comments to that section and doubtless we'll have more. I'm conscious of time and um, we don't have any uh, op open questions as such at the moment uh, that I wanted to pick up. So can I invite you to, to go into your next section and then uh, we can carry on the discussion afterwards. Uh, yes, shall I just go on, yeah. Christina? <coughs> yeah? Yeah, I've put this one uh, Okay, um, this will be the last um, kind of block of uh, input from Christina and I, although obviously we hope to continue what has actually been a fantastically generative discussion already just in the, um, in the Q&A section. Uh, so we thought we'd close with um, uh, a little bit more detail on one of the motifs, as we're calling them, that have emerged from the project, and that's jumping, uh, children jumping in all sorts of um, contexts. And this is about watching children jump. Um, and the way that we're thinking of watching um, can give a, a slightly more concrete idea of what we're thinking about when we talk about attunement, which is one of the key terms for the project. Um, and as Christina said, we've come to think of watching as a method of attunement, but one that tries to be alert to emerging difference to what's unfolding in an event. So if you think of the guard in the watchtower or even the lookout in a meerkat group, um, being on watch is actually a matter of registering tiny differences in the environment. This kind of watching is more like sensing than observing, coming back to that notion again of um, the haptic, the mixture of sensing. Um, observation in, in ethnography tends to have a, a more distanced meaning, I think, even when we try to um, bring it closer by talking about participant observation. So um, this attentive watching for difference is almost like watching from the inside and the outside. You can't watch for meaningful difference unless you're watching from inside events um, that have meaning for the participants but at the same time you can attain a certain distance to watch uh, and we're thinking of jumping at the moment because it's somewhat overlooked in the developmental literature unlike walking and hopping which do figure as developmental milestones so we've observed or watched many different kinds of jumping although we're not really interested in categorizing them for instance, there's solitary jumping, and you can see this in the, um, <coughs> the image here of Anna, um, where she's uh, jumping from the sofa to a trampoline that her mother has placed there for extra jumping thrills. And from watching the slow motion video, we, we've come to see Anna's jump, and indeed all jumps, as assemblages. It's not a child jumping in an empty space but it's an assemblage. Uh, so here of the child and the, the ground and the sofa, the trampoline and the force of gravity and the camera and the tension and the explosive force of muscles and the triumph of performing skillfully for a camera and making your mother laugh. And it's also about different textures, squishy, bouncy, hard, and how they accommodate or repel bodies. But as we watch, we also see how Anna's jumping itself depends on very careful watching and very fine adjustments of her body. But, and I'm recalling here one of the questions that we had earlier, things also happen on the inside when we jump. There's the bodily and visceral thrill of the jump and its wages of gravity. Something has always changed in you in the event of the jump. So there's the solitary jumping, and then we uh, have been watching um, uh, what we've come to think of as the sociality of jumping and watching that unfold. So we've seen lots of um, uh, instance or instances of collective jumping, jumping in puddles as the image here, or sporadic eruptions of companionable jumping in response to uh, a video of five little monkeys. And we've seen how the affect of jumping is contagious. There's something about the splashy lure of water or the infectious rhythm of the nursery rhymes that infiltrates and agitates bodies. 
And affect also connects bodies. It doesn't just agitate them, it connects them. In the puddle jumping videos, for instance, we see jumping itself ripple outwards to other feet uh, who begin to synchronize themselves, if only momentarily, into the stamping rhythm of a collective rather than a bunch of individual children. So again, there's that notion of the event growing outwards uh, and uh, nevertheless collecting children inwards. Uh, I'm going to close now for this little bit by um, just saying a little bit about how Frugal's thinking actually resonates with some key issues in current theories that also focus on the senses and on movement and matter and embodiment. <coughs> um, these theories go by a number of names, uh, post-humanism, new materialism would be two examples. Um, and one thing that interests us is the points of convergence between Froebel and this contemporary thinking, because we see it as a very rich, um, dynamic area for rethinking children's development and our engagement with it. So um, just to sort of very quickly summarize some points of um, convergence, um, a first quite obviously is that um, there's, the, there's a renewed interest in sensation and embodiment in human encounters. We've lived through a long period of um, uh, social constructivism and other theories which have placed a lot of emphasis on language and discourse. And it's not to say that these are not important, but there has been a downplaying of sensation and movement and embodiment. Um, <clears throat> and the things that um, give language, if you like, its dynamism and its potential uh, to mean something new. And linked to that, uh, another point of convergence um, is a, a, a constant awareness of the fact that our human affairs are always entangled with more than human agency, with water and asphalt and gravity and rhythm and, temp and tempo. Um, and I'm reminded here of um, the phrase that Christina quoted earlier about um, Frugal saying how children absorb the material world. And I think that our slow motion video gives very interesting insights into how that process of um, intense resonance with the world works productively for children in helping them in whatever adventures they're engaged in. Um, a further point of uh, resonance is um, in fact, it's really a restatement of what I've already said, how human connectivity and collectivity depends crucially on this something that is more than language. And that's very important, I think, to bear in mind in contemporary contexts, particularly in the UK, but also elsewhere, where, <coughs> excuse me, policies um, <coughs> that are very concerned with um, school readiness or closing the attainment gap often come to focus very closely on language. And again, this is not to say that language is not important, but it's clearly so much not everything that's going on in children's lives and their development. <clears throat> and the final point of convergence um, is between Froebel and contemporary uh, theories is the centrality of process and emergence of how events and life itself unfolds in, resonate, in resonance with our environment, but also with, as we've talked about, with movements on, on the inside, with sensation and affect. So the research and Froebel's thinking reminds us that the sociality of children is fed by so much more than language. Their bodies and their senses perform complicated dances, if you like, of advance and retreat, and they experience connection and joy from small things that we adults have learned to forget often in our preoccupation with language. So the project is helping us to take our lead from children in how we might engage with their development. And it's also um, made us intimately aware of the complexity of children's and adults' uh, occupation of space um, <laughs> and their interactions with the material environment. Space isn't just a, an empty container for children to locate themselves in. Children's bodies animate and carve out space in complex interactions with the material environment, and their senses and their movements are intimately intertwined with their linguistic and their cognitive development. 
so we're just coming uh, towards the point of um, what's the relevance of this for life uh, after COVID, I guess. At the moment, as we've said, and as everyone knows only too well, nurseries and schools are being obliged to curtail or alter very seriously the spaces where children can exercise this kind of embodied and sensory sociality. And we wonder about the developmental implications of this potential sensory motor deprivation. And Sasha alluded to this question at the beginning. So we hope to be able to mobilize the project's insights ultimately to combat it. So to close this piece of uh, uh, this section of the uh, talk, um, what might unfoldment and self-activity offer us as we confront an early years landscape that's reconfigured by COVID? So here are some of our provisional questions. They're not even themes or issues or motifs even at the moment, but questions that we're mulling over from the research so far. Uh, and one of them is about how, could, how might we rethink and reanimate the space of the nursery. And a, a set of questions around that would be, what might replace the containment and the stripping back of shared use of toys that hygiene often seems to be demanding at the moment? Could more time be spent outside? How might we introduce opportunities for multi-sensory adventures and large and small movements inside the bubbles or the pods in which children may be uh, contained for a while? A second um, idea that we're thinking about at the moment is revisiting the notion of the gift of gifts um, and wondering whether we could do more with materials and objects. In Christina's previous research, she noticed how children's tactile engagements with objects and materials like sand and water can't be separated out from the learning and their ways of being with other children. And we're reminded again of Froebel's account of the hands and their involvement in the plastic expression of ideas uh, and how thinking is always in relation to doing or acting or making. And the final um, uh, issue that we're thinking around at the moment, and again this has come up in the discussion already, is um, to what extent the project offers the opportunity to radically rethink the relationship between home and school. Are there ways that school playgrounds might be used by communities outside school hours? Could there be shared caring for gardens? And above all, I think, could these new spaces of encounter across the boundaries of home and school support the development of mutual practices of attunement to children's unfolding capacities? So we're going to pause there now, I think, and have some discussion. And then at the very end, we'll look back and talk briefly about where the project's going in its um, second half, if you like. So, um, yeah, shall we open it up again now for a bit of discussion? Absolutely. Thank you both for a, a, another fascinating section to the to the discussion. Um, we've we've had. Uh, two points made about outdoor environments um, and, and you've indeed just been talking about space uh, generally but also more specifically about the opportunities that outdoor uh, environments, natural environments perhaps might offer. I wondered if you could give um, a, a little bit more of an insight into your thinking around um, outdoor environments and that relationship between the visceral experiences that uh, children might have, um, as well as the, the, um, the in other words, the inner, in Froebel's sense, uh, mm -hmm. that relationship, as well as uh, the relationship to the outer uh, environment, making that connection between the inner and outer. Um, do you think that um, it's <laughs> substantially different uh, depending on whether children might be indoors or outdoors or um, touching a tree or touching a pavement, mm -hmm. uh, splashing in a puddle or um, swinging on a rope. Um, shall I go? Yeah. I mean, there's lots to be said about this and, and it would depend on, you know, very long conversations with practitioners and parents and children. Um, I think it's important not to be too um, romantic about the outdoors. Uh, there are very many different ways of being outdoors and they're not, they're not all great. But one thing that we've been thinking about um, 
is the way in which outdoors, simply by changing the um, sensory environment, might animate and allow children to do things that they don't always get the chance to do within the, what you might call the normal space of the classroom. Um, and in fact, in a, in a different project, but one that has a lot of resonance, Abby Hackett and I are, um, have written a paper recently on what happened when <coughs> a nursery school um, changed quite a lot of its provision to happen outside. And it wasn't just that the whole tenor and um, uh, structure of sessions changed, but they began to use language differently and to learn differently. So um, there's a lot still to be learned about how changing the environment and the impact that makes on children's inner worlds um, feeds into what we call development. Christina, do you want to come in and say a bit more about that? <coughs> Just picking up on um, Maggie mentioning um, asphalt and um, and then we've got trees. So again, uh, I think we need to be careful to think about, there's a tendency to, to romanticize the naturalness of an environment. And when you're living in a city, being outside is not necessarily yeah. uh, always about um, green spaces. Um, that being said, I think, um, an awareness about growth and soil and an engagement with that is is something that's really important um, in terms of so again I suppose linking back to that sense of COVID and thinking about about our earth in a general way I think there's something that is very very important about grounding ourselves in that and grounding and allowing our children to be grounded in that um, but I certainly I certainly also think the outdoor environment with its ability to allow those very much bigger movements in terms of running and jumping those things that is really on a very sort of foundational level that's really important and if you're in a small house or a classroom you you can't do those things in the same way and they are really, they seem to me to be very, very important. And I feel, again, that coronavirus will raise lots of questions about the, almost the politics of space for families. So thinking about people who've been locked down, who don't have access to gardens, um, and thinking about how do we make that public space um, available mm. to families. And, and families reclaim public spaces mm. that perhaps in the past have been, you know, you know the the parks and when in Victorian times uh, when they were set up. So and again, Froebel's got a lot of a lot um, in terms of the way he was taken up in terms of public space and playgrounds. Yeah. We've we've had a number of comments in actually relating to um, outdoor environments, and I think judging by the comments that they're relating more specifically to the to natural environments although not necessarily um uh, one for example talking about the winnicottian idea of of holding um and that the outdoors uh, is is really important for that um not only for sensory learning but also i guess the the, the emotional side um with reference to children's return after the the covid pandemic um, and, and that, that very sensitive engagement uh, is referred to in that, uh, it's from Elizabeth. Um, we've, as I say, we've had another, uh, a couple more comments also talking about the importance and value of outdoor environments, not only um, in, for today's practitioners, but also, of course, for Froebel himself. Um, we've had two more questions that I want to pick up. One goes back to what you were just talking about, which is the idea of imminence. Um, and um, the question is specifically about, you know, in what ways did, did Froebel talk about emanating? Um, and the second question, um, in case it's, it's relevant to talk about it uh, at the same time, really, because it, it brings in families, is... Um, about uh, sorry i'm just trying to find it again mm -hmm. um, how how parents in particular but also staff have responded to watching their children in such uh, minute detail uh, through your slowed down films
Um, the first question about emanating and Froebel, I would love to know more because <laughs> I, it's not something I know about his thinking. So um, that's that's an area I'd love to know know more about um, how how he thought about that. Um, well, I can. Uh, I'll, it, the question was from Stella Louis, and I'm sure that Stella would love to pick that up yeah. with you. Um, Is it possible to unmute her? I'm not sure. Um, Victoria, yeah. are you able to do that for us? Yes, I'm just going to try and do that now. <laughs> Hope Stella's still with us. <laughs> Stella, you should be able to speak now. Hello. Hi, Stella. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't imitating. It was imitating. It was you talked uh -huh. about imitating. Um, ah. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I read it as imminence. That's okay. You're forgiven, Sasha. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just. I just. I just wanted to kind of unpick that a little bit more because um, my understanding is it's not just about mere copying but it's mm -hmm. it's more of a translation or yeah, just how they transfer the, the knowledge from one from somebody other than themselves into themselves again linking to the inner and outer but i just wanted your your take on imitate it mm -hmm. So I, um, I think when, when in child development theory, there's a lot of stuff about copying and imitating, as you said, where there's this idea that you're, you're, you're trying to be like something else. And I think um, uh, even some of the stuff around theory of mind is based on that. And what, what we're trying to play with, I think, and Maggie might be able to expand on that, for me is that actually it's not necessarily as you said about being the same as something else it's about becoming different um, and experiencing that difference and I guess for me it makes me think much more about how how you it experiencing something is such an important thing in terms of how you know something um, so it, it for me it's sort of really making me think about that bodily knowledge and how when you when you when you become different when, whether you're becoming somebody who's who's praying because you've been had that studied kind of watching somebody else at that moment that you're going through those actions you become different you don't become the same as that person so that's that's what i'm thinking maggie would you like to pick up on that yes i mean i would absolutely agree with that i'm fascinated stella by imitation myself and how much of it children do and by how diminished it has been in the developmental literature because i think you're absolutely right and also what christina said i mean i think imitation when children do that um astonishingly actually competent if you like imitation it's because it's about an intense again it, attunement to movements and things that are going on in the in the environment that they internalize inside them so it's almost like channeling rather than um uh you know as christina said that notion of you see something and you copy it it doesn't seem to us to be like copying in that sense at all it is much more about uh becoming uh becoming the um the thing or the person that you are uh, imitating yeah it's interesting, but just I think from my point of view, I was just keen to just find out from the parents' viewpoint, did they see their children imitating them and things that they had experienced through, yeah, their first own, yeah, their first-hand experiences? Uh, what what uh, often seemed to strike a parents when they were watching it was that sense of how how expert and competent the child became when they took on this other thing. So that was the thing that kind of struck us and made us think, oh, and, and parents were very, because yeah, you, you kind of don't have that sense of your child is absorbing that to that degree. because It's not something they're doing every day. And yet when they, when they do that, we suddenly see how 
this kind of amazing competence. Mm. You, you've picked up there the other question that was uh, um, asked, uh, Christina, which was about um, parents' responses. I don't know whether any parents um, are, are from Martinscroft have joined us because I'm afraid I don't know their names. Um, mm -hmm. We do have uh, Shabnam with us. Um, I don't know whether you want to bring anybody in and if indeed you can see the list of participants. Um, but uh, if there's anything else that you wanted to talk about in relation to responses um, of those who viewed the videos, um, I think there is an interest in hearing a bit more about the, the ways in which people reacted to seeing their children and perhaps themselves uh, if they were involved in the videos. Um, I'm just looking at that. I'm just having a little look in the audience. To see. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll allow Salma to talk. She doesn't have to talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, Salma um, uh, is Anna's mum, and we we spent some time looking at that film, and Salma was. Um, participating in the conversations that me and Maggie were having when we were writing that paper. Um, so, um, Salma, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay. <laughs> would, would you, are you okay just to say a little bit about what she, uh, about how it made you think when you were looking at um, uh, uh, Anna jumping? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, I think it was really interesting to see to actually, um, you know, sharpen my eyes, <laughs> um, and actually looking at Hannah, focusing on what she's doing uh, with a with a lens, <laughs> um, because quite often I just leave her to jump on her own, or just uh, I'm, I'm casually doing something else, uh, but actually really looking um, closer, um, you see other things that is not you just don't see. Uh, in the just everyday life <laughs> um so um and i think one of the things i'm interested in as well is the the like a, a, a something like a sofa for example something that we look at as a relaxing uh, object in, at home or something that we just might read a book on or something but for hannah it's something else she sees it as something else totally so <laughs> it's like a um a jumping object or, or something that she she maybe uh, she transforms it into other things, which is something really interesting. Um, the whole house is like this for her. <laughs> for us, it's a totally different thing. So, yeah. Thank you. That was a great observation. Absolutely. Fascinating to hear that um, idea of the, the transforma many transformations of a sofa um, from a child's yeah point of view and uses. And we've had um, a, a, the suggestion of um, a book chapter from Rosie um, about empathy imitation in the social brain, um, which she felt might be helpful. Um, we've had a comment from Elizabeth um, uh, that says children can't oblit obliterate the actions around them as their mirror neurons naturally imitate everything around them in micro movements that can't avoid this. Their play allows them to express that in their own way. Um, and I think that um, we have pretty much, oh no, I beg your pardon, we've got a, a couple more comments. Um, someone uh, like me absolutely loved Salma's expression, Sharp of My Eyes. <laughs> yes. uh, I don't know who's written that, but I thought that was the most wonderful expression. Um, and we've got uh, one more question. I think we've just probably got time for one more question from Martin, um, who um, uh, talks about mind-body interconnectedness um, linked with attentive watching. He's referring to sports coaches, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he says, is, is appreciation of literature, poetry, enhanced by early haptic experience? Mm. It's a fascinating question, isn't it? Um, to what extent do our um, early sensory experiences, movements uh, affect our 
appreciation of the arts later in life. I, I think that's what Martin's saying. Uh, forgive me if I've interpreted that incorrectly, Martin. Well, I mean, that's uh, a provocative qu question way beyond the scope of the project, but it's an interesting one. Um, I think the, um, it depends on what your view of art is. I mean, if you um, look at um, Deleuze's writing on Francis Bacon, uh, for instance, I mean, his suggestion is that art helps us to um, uh, experience affects that we um, can't put into words or put into any other way. So I think the relationship between uh, the haptic and art um, is very um, uh, complex. I don't know what, you know, I don't know of anything that can prove yet whether there is a, you know, a cause and effect notion to it. But given that art is about um, stirring up uh, affects and experiences that aren't necessarily lived in in the world, then there must be some kind of link. Christina is an artist and will have <laughs> more interesting things to say about that than me. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a proper artist, but I have to say that we have, um, we have um, a lot of um, uh, students who are studying with us at the moment, um, some of whom are in the audience, I think, um, who are uh, dancers and musicians and um, actually the end the way we would like to um, finish this project, we had planned to, in a month's time, have an immersive event um, where, where we would have families and children, they'd be touching and feeling objects, which of course we can't do. So we need to think, rethink that um, and, and possibly um, using uh, projections and uh, film projections could be a way to be in a space but not be touching objects. So again, it's that inventiveness of thinking differently about um, sociality and the senses um, when we've got these um, rules that we have to abide by. But I do think there is something very, very um, important about poetics and aesthetics that the arts brings. And again, I think that's something to think about in terms of possibly roles for artists at, at this particular point who are uh, not able to do performances, theatres and um, those kind of venues aren't working. So I'd love to see a repurposing of artists to work with schools at this time of recovery and moving forward, because I think there's a lot to offer there. Well, thank you both. Um, I, I don't know if you want to say a few final remarks. We're very close to the end of our time, I believe. Um, and I think you have um, answered a huge number of questions and led us in an absolutely wonderful um, and very provocative uh, conversation this afternoon. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you so much to, for everybody coming it's really strange not being able to see you i wish i could see you all but um it's been so lovely to have so much engagement and so many interesting questions i was really worried that it would feel really one way because it's the first time we've tried to do something like this but it's been great having so much interaction and so many questions and thank you sasha for chairing it so nicely and being able to bring the questions in because it's so difficult when you're talking to to be able to see, see that happening. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yes, and I would just like to echo that as well. And to say the questions have been um, the absolute kind of um, driving force of this discussion. And they, they themselves, I think, have grown outwards like crystals from the edges. <laughs> uh, so thank you to everyone. And of course, to Sasha and Victoria for making all of this um, not only work, but work really well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, do you want to put our email up? Oh, okay. oh yes. Uh, let me, uh, sorry. Um, any questions or thoughts, do, do contact us.